Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the New Trust Economy. I'm Tracy Hazard. And I'm Monica Profit. And this week, we are going to talk together about our two interviews we had with the founders and CMO of Quantum RE. And we interviewed, I interviewed John Livesey, and you interviewed... Yep, I interviewed Matthew Sullivan. It was so much fun. He was a blast. And he had the weirdest stories to tell me about his long and varied working history. It was amazing. Well, and and so John Livesey and I have been friends. We, in fact, have gone to events and people thought we were brother and sister. So like, and we've only known each other like three or three or four years, something like that. But like, that's how well we know each other that we get along so well that people think we're siblings. <laughs> I have a couple of friends like that where people either think that we've been dating forever or they think that we're siblings. I'm like, hmm, nope, neither yeah. one of those things, but okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is, so I was happy to invite John on when he, I knew he was working in this new venture because it, I knew he, first off, he's a great guest. So always because he has his own podcast, so he knows what he's doing there. But he doesn't get involved in ventures. Like I mean, he has advised a lot of startups and um, gotten to help people get a lot of angel investing and things like that. And he wouldn't join in. Like he's the outside consultant. He's helping them learn. So he wouldn't join in if it wasn't something you know, phenomenally interesting to him and worth it. And so for him to jump into something like this, and when you're talking about blockchain, cryptocurrency, like all of these things, I'm like, what are you doing, John? And I got to know more. (laughs) And he's like, perfect, because you have a podcast to put that on. So let's do this. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what I thought was really, you know, fascinating about your interview with Matthew was it's like it was really talking about kind of like the whole path of Genesis of how he got to thinking what he's thinking. And I think that's really similar to what you've been doing with your own Rise Housing. So tell me a little bit about, you know, the, what you were thinking about when you were interviewing him. Well, first of all, he has had such a varied background. I mean, you're going to hear stories about like being able to commute to work in a helicopter. (laughs) I mean, crazy stuff, things that like you just don't, the average person does not do. And so that was really interesting just to hear the different things he's done. I mean, overseas, domestically, his background in real estate is phenomenal and um, pretty wide and varied. Some of the things that he's working on doing, everybody's, you know, kind of working out their next step based on what they already know. And so his concept is a bit different from mine. It's perfect. They fit together so well. We're going to be rounding out this blockchain meets real estate space beautifully. I mean, I love seeing the players in this space doing what they're doing because each one of us, you know, might know a little bit more about great lending initiative, you know, that are, that's happening domestically, or someone else knows about Regulation S, and they know all of these incentives to bring in foreign investment, or, and people are piecing together the pieces of expertise they have, and they're putting it into this very cool, streamlined, hyper-trustable platform. And then there's some people that are just like, well, I just know the hyper-trustable, streamlined stuff. I guess real estate, sure, I'll add that, which it's still, that's a very huge value add, right? So his particular... Um, take on it was just really pulled from his extensive knowledge in innovative lending and looking at equity from a single family home perspective, which is really, um, he's got, he's, he was talking a lot about his opportunities in California because there's a huge single family home um, market size there. That's well, not necessarily where, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of people in other markets are looking at. A lot of people are focusing on density only. They're focusing for different reasons, mostly because they don't have a single family home background and he really does. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's, it is because I'm right here in this market that he's talking about. Right. Yeah. And so I see it, but it, and you know, and the interesting thing is, is that it is, it is already a lot of investment market here. So I live in an entire neighborhood that it ha- is predominantly Asian investment. And a lot of the owners, uh, a lot of people are renting these homes are, you know, go to UCI as, as professors or in the medical fields and other things. And they're not into, they're in long-term rentals because they they're stationed here, you know, for the time right. of their residency or something like that. So there's a lot of that going on and their, their owners of the house are not living in this, in this country. And so we have a lot of that going on. And then we also have a lot of people who are in a way, we have a, a large aging group here who've been in Irvine specifically, that's where I am. If for decades and you know their 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 house values have gone up and down and all over the place and you know and they're looking at what's next and that reverse mortgage is awful scary yeah and so I thought that I thought that that was really an interesting angle that they were taking for that that generation yeah yeah that generation I mean there's there's just a lot of equity that's tied up in assets that have been held for a long time I mean that's that is one thing that especially over the last 40 years if somebody decided okay we're gonna bite the bullet this year 
and then waited that all out and watched that mortgage finally go away. That's a lot of equity. That's a huge amount of, of personal net worth that's untapped without a huge lifestyle change. And who wants that? A lot of people don't. And the reverse mortgage is only, well, soon we can say, is only one of many products that can get you what you want for your lifestyle, especially as your life needs change and as you age, you know, it's great. I thought it was really interesting. So when I interviewed John, he was talking about some of the, one of the new things they have coming out, which is kind of like being like the house or Zillow of this sort of understanding you can make a faux investment and sort of see, oh, did your portfolio grow? Were you able to do this? And so it kind of gives you a sense of, of tasting what this is going to be like, because it is this kind of great unknown. Is it too much risk? Should I be doing it? And how can I get a taste of that? And I thought that was a brilliant marketing strategy on their part. And I think it it really helps to ease that education process on how it works. Absolutely. And I mean, that's what you want to do. You want people, nobody wants to have an investor not know what they're doing and then be like, buyer's remorse. It's your fault. You know, (laughs) nobody wants to be there. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) No matter what, even in 3d printing, because I know that you have a a podcast in 3d printing and it seems like that will be leaps and bounds away from this topic, but it's not even in consumer products and 3d printing and manufacturing and distributed manufacturing. Nobody wants to be doing it wrong and suddenly be like, I don't, I'm taking my ball and going home, you know, like, you know what? That reminds me of this great story of, of so we had, the, we had this woman who I absolutely adored who was our assistant for a while and she would post up some of our blogs and every so often she would do some things and she would find these great articles out there because she was always searching and so it was fantastic. And she moved away, her husband's in the military and she moved away um, and, and Grace, that's her name, and Grace came back and had said she, they bought this house down in Texas and it had a doorbell that was like cracked and broken. It was like the case cover for the doorbell. And so she said, well, I know enough about this 3D printing stuff to like explore and try to find someone to 3D print this for me. And she wrote a whole blog on the site, which I'll connect to this article so you can read it because it's just really an interesting story of her going out and trying this 3D print thing because she thought she had enough knowledge from our podcast and from from working with us, not to 3D print herself. She knew she was going to hire someone and she hired someone to do the design work and everything and they weren't far away. She brought her doorbell to them so that it would be a perfect fit and gets the whole thing back and installs it in her door and it looks you know it's all it looks good it fits why it did everything she was supposed to do but she had one regret that she forgot to like clearly spell out that she would prefer it to be in a specific in the color that originally was instead they he just did it in some kind of bronze color that like right. you know, so, you know whatever you was in the machine probably and she wasn't right. specific about it and so she was like kind of like I really rookie error didn't really think this all the way through and so but also I love, rookie manufacturing error right why would you make a decorative item without specifying color right without asking your client right exactly right. but that's kind of how the process goes in these early days so you're right it's not totally buyer's remorse but it was like oh yeah rookie error like yeah. it's, <laughs> and that kind of thing so yeah, yeah. E- exactly how it goes so I, I'm glad you brought that up the other th- question I had for you so I really we're starting to see um, the op- the possibility of a, of a real estate bubble bursting in the next few months for sure. And, you know, um, we have a, we have a really top podcaster who is um, in the note closing business. So the note closer show, Scott Carson, and he is of the opinion that he's going to be doing a lot more distressed note business coming forward. You know, what opportunity does that have for Quantum RE being successful? And uh, because the need is going to get bigger, right? Right. Right. I mean, I think that everybody wants to see some kind of a balance. And when we have the, the market shift from like a god of need and then people rush in and then like, oh, no more need. Oh, people run rush out. And really what we're looking for is stability and volatility and stability from our volatility. Right. So if we can get stability, it's going to come from having multiple different people playing a role. It was it reminds me of um, <clears throat> the story I heard about one of the things that has made Bitcoin less volatile than it might have been which is- I love that, this story. I'm so know, glad you're going to tell it. <laughs> today, which is, um, there are these, apparently, according to the myth, I'm waiting for more information. I'll try to get it to you. I'd love to have links about this. But there are apparently, there was a, a quite a large adoption of Bitcoin purchasers in the Japanese housewife demographic. So not exactly your most risk-taking demographic, right? And they were like, so apparently when, when Bitcoin would start to you know, jump up too much, they, they were not interested in like hyper crazy gains, but when it fell too much, they would buy. And then by buying and by buying in bulk like that, the way that they were, they, they, no one person did it. It was just a one psychographic did it because enough of those people of that, of that psychography were in it. So 
that had its own stabilizing factor. I think that there's going to be something amazing if we see this, this real estate bubble burst, but it's followed also, or it's in tandem with this new asset where more people can take less actual amount of risk, but get involved in the asset class, we might find ourselves recovering more quickly. Well, that makes me wonder whether or not Satoshi's a woman. Oh, I have, I have definitely, I've seen a lot of, of uh, <laughs> female t-shirts. In fact, I almost got one and then I like, I was slacked out and I, I missed, yeah. I missed out with like the first 50 free ones. <laughs> I know. So for those of you who don't know um, and are new to this and are really on this because we're really mostly talking about blockchain, Satoshi Nakamoto is the the, and I'm putting air quotes here. So if you're listening to this on the podcast, you can see it, inventor of Bitcoin. Right. And so, so, um, and there is this uncertainty as to whether or not it's an actual person or it's a group of people or it's a woman, right? right. It could be a woman, right? And not a guy. And so, you know, that's kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting reason. Why would all of these Japanese housewives adopt it? You know, would I trust it because, it? right? Yeah, Exactly. And so anyway, that I think that's a really interesting, an interesting one. But I do see what's going on. And I think that really, that's the big opportunity for Quantum Marie, for Rice Housing, which is yours, and for some of the other real estate, um, I'm going to call them ICOs that we've seen go into play here. Or, or maybe the ICO so much as real estate trading platforms, like trading Zillow platforms. Meets E-Trade. You know, I mean, we're all doing it in some different ways. Some people more on the debt side, some people more on the equity side. And whether you know what that is or not, all of us, everybody, and ev- whether it's, I mean, every part of blockchain, everyone, this is just what I was talking about with another one of our guests, actually, um, Lisa Loud. It was like, we've got to be doing more to bring in more mass adoption. And how are we going to do that? We have to incentivize, we have to educate, we have to make this not scary, and also make it easy to just try it. Low risk. Well, and and that, that's where I see a a, a economic situation like a bust, right, really will help in sort of forcing adoption because you have a desperate need. So we have a need to balance this out and not end up in in more economic trouble with, you know, bankruptcies and foreclosures and all of those things going on. If there's an alternative option, I'm going to take it. Well, think about it. If there is somebody who's, uh, even if we just say, let's back up from any particular model, you find two bankruptcies. One of them was a bankruptcy that's just traditional. And you know what? Someone else is going to buy that. Uh, out of bankruptcy, it's going to be in foreclosure, it's going to be really cheap. That one buyer is going to get the cash together and take it eventually. But if this, if this asset goes down, the second bankruptcy is the same asset, goes down just as much, it's distressed, but a bunch of people have a chance to buy a little piece of it and not risk all of it to go all the way in on that entire house or that entire asset, yeah. that's less risk. That yeah. in and of itself, that means, you know, a market like this is going to give people the chance to go, you know, I'll, I'll gamble a little bit. And we might see like some of the conservative nature of people actually get a place to to steward the economy more, which is fine. You know, right. that's why I think we might be able to stabilize and keep from hitting a real rock bottom here and having right. that have a you know multi year effect instead. Yeah. It's a, more of a short term dip yeah. and market correction, as you might you know you might refer to it. So I, I think this is really hopeful and really interesting, and I'm excited for Matthew and John and for Quantum RE to see how they how they uh, are adopted and how fast they go. And I think you know they're they're I'm not going to say it's a litmus test for the success of blockchain, but I think that it's going to be an in indicator of of educating and and how that adoption can happen it's going to be a model for that yeah definitely can you just repeat that it's going to be an indicator because you froze up for a second just that last sentence Uh, well it shouldn't happen on my end because we're recording on both ends so from the audio standpoint will be great but i think rather than being a litmus test right um it's going to be sort of this indicator of how blockchain companies how these kinds of ventures will be able to you know uh get adopted and become the model for how to how to educate and communicate so that it becomes successful for every one of you offering these kinds of uh, icos and and these kinds of ventures that are really going to be helping uh, in the real estate world as well and in some of the other other categories of of oh absolutely supply chain is going to be disrupted there's going to be so much more opportunity not only to to make supply chain easier to push around but also disrupt it in the case of like say human trafficking you know tracking inventory when you have a nefarious inventory like human beings and young girls 
it's going to be amazing to see that actually put somewhere permanently and then being able to, to be able to, to take some action against it, which is, I just feel like there are so many great possibilities in blockchain in general, but also I kind of picked real estate and I think maybe, maybe this is what Matthew picked real estate for as well is, which is, it's not, it's not a moving target. A lot of people understand it. Everybody engages it, whether they're buying or they're renting, everyone's in it. Um, if they're lucky, so, so lucky to have a home, they're in it. There's so, not as much new to explain to them. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I buy three shares of Apple and I don't know anything about the likelihood of Apple being profitable next year, but I kind of have a pretty good idea. I think idea you're probably it. safe. <laughs> right. Okay. Maybe I'm kind of safe, but I, think yeah. people, I mean, how many people are staring at like real estate porn, really? You know, like those pretty pictures that come out if they just want to see, oh, it's just like window shopping and other lives well, that, you, that you're not that, even going to buy. That's the one reason why I was so excited about the, the tool that John was talking about, about them being able to like try it because I have a lot of, a lot of people have said things to me, like their favorite thing to do is to go on house and decorate and, or to go on right. Zillow and like, like, you know, uh, you know, kind of troll houses, like, you know, like, oh, yeah. I'd like to buy here, but they're not on the market. They're not ready to move, but they are still looking at houses all the time. Or the, yeah. you know, the people who go to, you know, open houses every weekend. Oh, like, I'm not going to say I've never done that. <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> it was, absolutely. So, well, to all of you listening to the New Trust Economy, we want to remind you that you can find us at newtrusteconomy.com. You can also find us on social media at New Trust Economy. And uh, Monica and I will be back next time, each of us separate, and then again together with some episodes for next week. Thanks yeah. so much for sharing this with us. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time.